<laughs> anyway, I'm sure in two places in your Bible this morning, if you could please, Nehemiah chapter 4. Deke, if you'll come and just turn us to Nehemiah chapter number 4 and Hebrews chapter number 12. Nehemiah chapter number 4 and Hebrews chapter number 12. I think you would agree we're living in exceptional times. I, don't, I haven't really heard of anybody, I haven't known or met anybody that was around in 1917 or 1918 that can tell me what it was like when it, the pandemic came through in 1917 and 18. Now there may be somebody still alive that I don't know of, but all we read is a historical record. And if you look historically where the world was, as well as the United States was in 1917 and 1918, and now you progress nearly 100 years, 100 and what, three years later, things have changed just a little bit. Would you agree? I mean, I think things are somewhat different. So to say that there is a comparison, there wasn't even the same amount of people. But not only that, they didn't have the capability with the Internet and with television and with a bajillion news channels and all that other stuff to be able to broadcast on a regular basis. You are inundated every day with death tolls and what's going on in financial markets and what's going on. I guarantee you they didn't have that back then. They just knew there were a lot of people that were dying. And then that led shortly within about a 20-year period or so, 30-year period or so, you go into the Second World War there. And then after the Second World War, you know, you have all the atrocities that took place there. But as far as I know, for us in this generation, it's unprecedented times. Is that a fair statement? Not just being under pressure, not just being at war, not just being uh, in a world war or being in Vietnam or being in Korea, Iran, Iraq, whatever it may be. Not just being at those wars, but something that has individually, personally affected every one of us on an individual basis. It's affected your family, it's affected your friends, it's affected your acquaintances and people that you're around, your jobs, the way things are run, your church activities, and so on and so forth. And it's times like that that we forget why we're here in the first place. God's mission hasn't changed. He's still interested in seeing people go to heaven when they die as opposed to going to hell. He's still interested in getting something done to help and encourage Christians. And he hasn't all of a sudden stopped his clock and said, hey, let's take some time off for the pandemic to go through. Uh, let's pause for just a few moments here and get your eye off the ball. No, the Lord's still like, well, I haven't changed what I need to have done. So we have to sort of get our focal point back on him as opposed to on everything else going on. Here's a story in Nehemiah chapter 4. You know, he's the cupbearer for the king and he uh, comes in one day. He has a, a problem with his face and the king said, what's wrong with your countenance and why are you sad? And he said, well, you know, my people are out there and they have a, a, a wall hasn't been built for them and they got the temple there and we'd like to have a wall built. And so the king said, well, go ahead and build it. And, and then they start getting opposition from Tobiah and Sembalad and the Arabians. I'm in verse 7. The Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and the breaches began to be stopped and they were very wroth. So right off the bat, what they're doing draws the attention of the enemy. Now let me just have you pause for a second. I'll let you be seated in just a second, but can I say this to you? Are we wrestling against governments of the world or against a virus or are we wrestling against flesh and blood or principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and rulers of darkness? What does the Bible say our, our, our enemy is? Amen. This is the nation of Israel and they are getting ready to do something God told them to do and immediately they have enemies that are wroth. Their enemies are representative of Ephesians chapter 6 going all the way back to when Nehemiah is building the wall and the same thing occurring now. Notice their enemies come up. The Bible says they conspired all of them, verse number 8, together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of who? Because of them, not because of people that don't agree with you and how you're commanded to come together or not come together. Amen. Your enemy is not the brethren. Amen. Right. Amen. Come on. Amen. Your enemy is not somebody that doesn't do it the way you do it. Right. Right. The enemy is Ephesians chapter number 6. Sure. Judah said, The strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed. There is, too, there is rubbish, much rubbish so that we're not able to build a wall and our adversaries 
said they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Brother Larry, you pray. Ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Lord, we thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ to yes. shed blood this morning. Yes. Yes. We thank you, Lord, uh, for a church to come to and the doors being open and we're able to, able to be here, Lord. We pray for those that are, that are watching. Lord, we thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for fellowship as we know it. And Lord, you abide and you living within and inside of us, Lord, this flesh and tabernacle. But we thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you for your presence in meeting, yes. uh, God, when we assemble. We thank you so much. We know it's not like that everywhere, but we cherish that, Lord, and we pray for that. Amen. We thank you. Amen. Thank you for a preacher now, and I pray your power might rest on him this morning as he yes. preaches to us. Yes. I pray that that he's studied out. I pray, God, you give him the utterance to preach and the words. I pray, God... Thank you for his help, and I pray, God, he'd have the strength to preach it. Yes. Uh, Lord, what you have him to say. Might your will be done, yes. and may your might and strength rest on him this morning. Amen. Help our hearts now. God, we're, we're wicked, uh, Lord, and we always have been, except yeah. for the blood and the washing. Yeah. Yes. So we, uh, we need a cleansing before we even open our ears. So we ask for help there, God, as the word might be useful to us and put to use in our lives. Jesus Christ today. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Before you turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, leave your finger there in Nehemiah. And let me just say this, that oftentimes people in and of themselves can become a hindrance. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Oftentimes the devil uses that which is closest to us or that which is most like us to discourage us. Now, the hindrances, ladies and gentlemen, are not always direct opposition. Sometimes, it's like we talked about in Sunday school, it's from another person who may be in agreement with something you're wanting to do that might be wrong to do, but now because you're hooked up with them, you feel like you got more momentum. And before long, instead of finishing what God called you and set you out to do, you're distracted onto something else. Distractions in the Christian life become a paramount issue our problem. Pair about meaning simply a focal point, meaning one of the things that is the most likely thing to happen. And what will take place is, is you get your eyes off of where you're going. I was taught a long time ago, you can't plow a straight line looking backwards. That just makes common sense. So nobody says if he would put his hand to the plow and turning back, he can't finish. Why? Because he's going to plow all over the place. While I believe that there ought to be a remembrance of what God's done for us in the past, oftentimes one of the greatest ways the devil hinders us in the present is to anchor us to something we did a long time ago. So, so when it comes to uh, uh, looking in the past, I would suggest selective amnesia. I would suggest that when you look in the past, that you only look in the past for the successes and the things that God has done, learn from the failures, but then move on. But we generally anchor in the failures. We generally have the anchor, the, the, the failures blown up bigger than the successes. And instead of remembering how many times God got us through, we just have to remember we're not getting through it at the particular moment. Do you with me? You understand? You know what he says? They have a wall to build. Now, if anybody was going to have opposition under the king's order, it doesn't make a difference who it came from. They're supposed to build a wall to protect the city and that prevents invasions and those kind of things. So would you agree that they have a very noble cause and a good reason to do what they're doing. They got the king's authority behind them. They got God's desire behind them. They have the materials and stuff. They got the workforce that's there. It looks like, hey, everything ought to be great. They ought to go over there, crank up the back hose, get things moving, be able to get the cranes in place, get those walls built in no time at all. And they have no sooner broken ground before they even have turned a spade of dirt. All of a sudden, people that are around there have gotten together and said, shoot, man, they can't build a wall. Who do they think they are trying to build a wall. As a matter of fact, that wall will be so feeble if a little fox runs across it, the whole wall will fall down. They're mocking them. They're belittling. They're making fun of them. Can I draw your attention to the fact that it was not that they had any validity in anything they said? Can I say it was a technique of the devil to try to get them distracted and turn their energy and efforts that should be spent on building the wall to turn it and be distracted toward fighting an enemy that did not even need the credibility of having a fight? 
One of the things that we are missing today, I believe, is so much emphasis is being put on something that we think we should be concerned about, and you should be reasonably. Uh, one guy said, you know, you're not even telling your people to prepare. That's not true. I just make the assumption, and I know where the nomenclature fits, and I know the acronym for it. I make the assumption that you have enough sense to know that if you think there's not going to be any food in the grocery store, you should probably go to the grocery store and get some food. And if you think that there's going to be a run on gasoline, you probably ought to fill your tank up. I don't have to get up here and give you 12 steps to a survival technique of how to protect yourself during the virus. I, I, what a waste of God's time and what an insult to your intellect and your intelligence to think, preacher, I've been putting food on the table for me and my kids for all this time and I can change diapers and make bottles and make kit, make, uh, do mathematics and homework and all that other kind of stuff. Close the cabinet door over here and do that and you're going to spend a whole service telling me how to prepare for the virus. Or as one preacher said, prepare for the tribulation because you're in it. Okay, well, you know, you're prepared for the tribulation. And I told him that. I said, my folks are prepared. He goes, really? I said, yeah, they're prepared. He goes, like they have like a shed with all their stuff in it and their bug out bags and all. I said, uh, no, brother, they got saved. They're not going to be here for the tribulation. <laughs> he goes, oh, well, yeah. Okay, well, look, I figure, <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, well, yeah, sure, yeah, oh, well, yeah, that too, you know. Well, I'm not going to turn this into a survivalist camp. I'm not going to bring you all in here and teach you, you know, how to do that, skin a fish and, you know, what what's that other thing that used to be, uh, get a buck knife or something and, and, and run a trot line and <laughs> I'm trying to set you all up. Y'all are like, we never heard that. You're from the South. You've heard that song, no matter if it was a drunk that sang it. But, 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 but here's the thing. The, 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 the devil tries to use a distraction. And the distraction is not that the people have any credibility at all. It is to prevent the work from going on. It has nothing to do with them. They're not taking it personal, but that it's a personal attack. Don't make any mistake about that. People can be very, very mean and vicious. I mean, Paul had Diotrephes, and Paul had Demas, and Paul had other ones that he said, everybody except Luke has forsaken me. And Jesus had Judas against him and, and other people against him. Paul had Barnabas come against him because of what happened to John Mark until later on, nine years later, those kind of things. But don't be distracted by a smoke and mirrors over here. Uh, a friend of mine calls that. He always told me to watch the birdie. And what he says is, is that whenever you're seeing all this going on, the real thing's happening over here. The real stuff's happening over here. What all this is, I don't know, but there's too much of this going on that's got your attention over here. Something's happening over here. Uh, you say, why? That's just what the deal is. Now, that may be personal opinion, but that is my opinion. There's just way too much blown out of proportion over here while somebody over here doing something under the table. It's just like, you know, it's a, it's a distraction at best. But for a Christian, what do we have to do? First of all, God said, build a wall. God told me, I'm going to build the wall. God's provided the finances. God's provided the thing. God said, go build a wall. God said to you, do whatever it may be to do, to finish school or to, or to be a good parent or whatever you fill in the block right there. And then all of a sudden, the first attack comes and the first attack is people that distract you onto something. Yeah, that's true, but... Yeah, but, 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 but what are we going to do? You know, a, a semi overturned and all the chickens got out. Okay, eat a pigeon. I don't, I don't, I mean, what do you, I, but, but one truck turning over doesn't mean there's a shortage. It, it's a conspiracy. Three trucks overturned in the same spot. Must be a bad turn in the road. But listen to me so you understand a silly illustration. That actually made headlines this past week. One group took those headlines and said, it is sabotaged by the enemy to create a food source. So three semi-trucks full of food overturned. One was frozen food, which I don't know. The other one was some kind of food that I don't even know anybody would eat in the first place. And then some eggs or something turned over. And here's what one group did with it. Watch closely now. One group said, it's a conspiracy to cause a food shortage. And so this is the beginning of the end because then they're going to start handing out food. Now, I agree the tribulation is going to be connected with food, and that's another story. The other group said three trucks turned over. 
Probably ought to have DOT go out there and take a look at why three trucks turned over. Because it looks like a bad... We used to have studies here. And one of the things they did, and I don't know if you still do it or not, but you were in traffic for a while back when you used to come visit me here. But one of the things that we used to do back in, in the days when I was here is they would do a study, and in that study they would look at what intersections are the most likely for people to have accidents. And of those accidents, which one are high volume uh, areas? And of the high volume areas, which one have uh, huge property damage and or death or injury? And so they give you the statistics, and so guess what happens? The wolf pack in those days, that's what they called us. I don't even know if that's politically correct anymore. But the wolf pack would go and target those particular areas because they were more prone to accidents. We realized that. We didn't think because there was an accident that took place, it was because of some larger conspiracy that somebody was trying to bring some kind of devilment to Jacksonville. It's just there's something wrong with the changing of the lights. There's something wrong with vision being obstructed. The speed for the highway is too high. There's something wrong here. You ever driven on the road? You go around a corner and you see a sign. It's a square sign, but it's turned up on a triangle. And it's sitting like that and you see a truck laying over on its side. That's a picture of a guy because they realize the guy's going too fast to read. So what he's saying is if you want to end up like this, keep going as fast as you're going. It basically says, slow down or you're going to wind up on your side. Because the weight shifts and it turns over. Why? Because the curve is only made for a certain speed. Contrary to what you may believe, speed limits are set on highways for a particular reason. One is a consideration for the residential area, the population of an area. So it protects pedestrians because p people can't get out of the way as fast as a car can. Secondly, it is because of the structure of the road, the way that it is built, and the inertia of a curve going around or something. It is set so that when you go around that curve, you're naturally going to drift to the side that you're going. If you're making a right-hand turn, you'll tend to drift to the left. You won't straighten the apex out. So what winds up happening, race car drivers might, but at any rate, you begin to drift. So they set it so you don't drift into the other lane. It's not done so they can write you a ticket. They set it at 15 miles an hour in a school zone, knowing that most people don't pay any attention to it anyway. They're going to go probably 20 or faster, but they know that at 15 miles an hour, if you do hit a kid, you are less likely to kill that kid than you are if you're going 25 or 30. It's not done so that the guy can come write you a ticket and get you in the speed trap and pull the little stick and have the box fall on top of you so you happen to be the one in the trap. Here's what I need for you to understand. The distraction often comes from what's the main thing. The old preacher used to say something. Some of the things he said were just really profound. He said one of the most difficult things to teach Christians is, number one, keep the main thing the main thing. Well, you would think that that should make perfect sense. We're Christians. We should have Jesus first all the time. But tell me this, how far down the list is he today? I mean, what is in front of him right now? Family matters, job matters, financial matters, family struggles, uh, school problems, difficulties, friends, boyfriends, whatever it may be. How far down the list is he? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added. Why does he tell us those things? Because he knows that in the Christian life, distractions come. And unfortunately, and it shouldn't be this way, unfortunately, sometimes those distractions are caused by people. Sometimes we don't realize that the attacks that are coming are not because of you personally. It is because of what you have set out to try and do. So therefore, your family comes under attack. Why? You're trying to live for the Lord. You say, well, why would that happen? To distract you from the main thing. Businesses come under attack. Your direction in life comes under attack. You're fighting about things that have no sense. They make no rhyme. They make no reason. Why? Because you're trying to serve the Lord and all of a sudden you have opposition along the way. Secondly, let me say this. Notice what happens in verse number 10. He says, the strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed. In other words, I've gotten tired of doing what I know to do. Faithfulness is something that's rarely preached on anymore, but it is a, a, a long-forgotten uh, uh, act of worship. It is something that very few people practice much anymore. It's uh, one of those kind of things where we're like, you know what, I'm just too tired. Well, one of the things that happens is, is that the strength of the bearer of the burdens is decayed. Why? I've gotten tired of doing so many other things. I don't have time for the Lord. I don't know about you, I've had a great time of self-reflection during this mess. I've had some time and my 
time is divided somewhat differently. I have a lot more on the phone than I was before, but uh, my time is somewhat divided up. But there's a lot of chances to look how easily you can get distracted and how much time you can spend looking into all kind of other things. And I don't know about you, but after a while, watching whatever you're watching and listening to whatever you're researching or whatever, after a while, even if you're sitting on your blessed assurance and moving the rat, it's exhausting. A friend of mine called me yesterday and he said, Preacher, uh, I'm this and this and this and this. And he was talking to me about some things and trying to make a decision. And I believe he made a really good decision. But here's what he said. He goes, there's so much information, there's really no information. They're, they're saying a lot of things, but they're not really saying anything. Do you understand? Stick your arm out. Right here. Okay, good. We're six feet, so we're good. So, so, so do, you, do you understand that oftentimes we don't even recognize, you don't even realize that the next thing you know, you're so overwhelmed and all you're doing is sitting there, but you just feel tired. All, you just feel exhausted. The anxiety comes up. You, know, you, you get every time you turn on the TV, they got to have the stinking ticker, ticker tape at the bottom. How many are dying? How many are in the hospital? What we're doing here? What's going on there? How many revolts are going on in whatever cities are going on because certain people are not allowed to do this? And the president said this and the, and the, run, the candidates say that and this and that and the other. And it's just, and the next thing you know, you're all, you're just watching TV. It reminds me of the days that my granddaddy had a heart attack. And they brought him home. This is my granddaddy on my daddy's side. He was a young man. He had a heart attack out there. And, and what he used to do is he liked to watch wrestling. Even though he knew it was fake, he would get all worked up, man. I mean, you know, I mean, who don't get ripped, uh, get excited about the zip, the zam, and the razzmatazz, and the bionic elbow, and coming out off of them ring ropes, and the boom, and I mean, you know... And nasty Ric Flair and all that kind of stuff. Oh, woo! Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> Purple Haze and all those guys. Purple Haze, he had a, he's, he's spitting all the time. He's a big old man, as big as TK. I mean, built out boy. He come out, whoosh, Andre the Giant. Now, some of y'all, Brother Ron knows, he worked some of those events down there. But, but some of those guys, well, my grandfather would watch that stuff and he'd be like, yeah. Mm. I mean, he'd be getting into the thing. And the doctor called my grandmother and said, turn that box off. He is going to have a heart attack watching that wrestling. Listen, granddaddy, don't you know that's fake? Yeah, but I like it. Yeah. <laughs> those guys, believe it or not, they're really good athletes. But here's the bottom line. It's sometimes you don't recognize there is attached to that or they wouldn't be broadcasting more than marketing. It is to get you excited, get you anxious, get you worried, get you concerned, get you to buy their product, get you to stay tuned, turn it back on. Oh, what's going to happen? How many of you remember the news from two weeks ago? You're like, what? <laughs> what were the headlines that were breaking news? And did it change your life? And did you even make any adjustment? But you got, honey, what's happening? Did you hear about? Yeah, and what was it now? Uh, yeah, I, um, hmm, I don't remember. Because they have to change it every single day, multiple times during the day. I'm trying to help you. You say, what does it do? It's made to drain you. When you get drained, you know what happens? It puts you in a passive state. You ever seen kids play video games? Don't you lie. You ever play video games? Don't you lie. And your wife comes in and says, dinner's ready. Dinner's ready. Hey, you idiot! Dinner's ready! Huh? What's she so jacked up about? Women, you ever done that during sports? Your husband's watching ball game or hockey or whatever it might be, and you go in and talk to him. It's like talking to that column. If it's the races or whatever it might be, he probably don't do that. He's Mr. <laughs> perfect. And, and you're talking? He's got auditory exclusion. He's like locked in. He thinks he's Mario Andretti coming around turn number three, you know. Dale Earn. Well, he's gone now. But, but at any rate, he should have had the hook on his helmet. But at any rate, guess what happens? You get so anxious. Here's what occurs. This is a physically 
scientifically proven point unless you're trained out of it. When you get under pressure, when you get under stress, when the saber-toothed tiger's coming after you, the bear's coming after you, whatever it be, two things happen. Number one, you get tunnel vision. And number two, you get auditory exclusion. Now, I'm going to help you with something, so listen to what I'm about to tell you. Oh, man, I am, I am moving in. Don't you get out your little metric tape measure and like, mm -hmm. He'd be finding me already. He's kind of like, oh, every, every inch closer. That'll be a little more on your tie there, preacher. I'm just saying. <laughs> Let me tell you something so that you know this, and you may or may not, and I know you're going to take the approach that I'm just defending the police, but I'm going to tell you something. You ever see the videotape of the police going, Stop resisting! Put your hands behind you! Idiot! And that was me at it. You ever seen that happen? Do you know what you don't know unless you've been in that situation? That person who is in fight or flight mode, not psychological, it's just a proven fact, he can't hear unless you elevate your, your voice to a point that it overcomes his nervous response to, I've been captured, I am in serious trouble, I am fixing to be confined, I am scared to death, on top of that I am mad, my anxiety is through the roof, and now all of a sudden when you're hearing on the outside, somebody screaming, they're hearing, and you're thinking, the police are mean. I can't believe they're doing... Why do they keep smacking him around? I mean, ain't one time enough? Because the person has visual impairment. He has tunnel vision. And he has auditory exclusion. That's why the next time your wife is screaming, recognize she ain't listening. She is anxious. She is upset. And all she's hearing when you're, she's seeing this. That was supposed to be funny. Y'all didn't laugh at all. You must have experienced that or something. But, but, but can you listen to me for a minute? Once the anxiety comes in, you get into a passive state. Now you're open to being demonically influenced. Because the guards are down. You're so wrapped up and... So anxious. Why? I told a friend of mine this week, skin for skin, all their man hath, he gives for his life. Why are these people doing this? They're preserving themselves. They, they lie, they cheat, they steal. I mean, they'll put wrong people in jail. They do whatever they do. They're preserving themselves. And when you get in that mode, what happens to you is you can't see anything except what's directly in front of you. You can't see what's going on around you. That's called peripheral vision. Are you with me? You can't hear anything. Spiritually, they can't hear anything. Do you think that's not being used to the devil? Why wouldn't he? He's the prince of the power of the air. Why wouldn't he take that and get you all jacked up about that? Why? Because then it prevents you from hearing what God says and seeing what God's trying to do. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like, well, I'm trying to build a wall. And yammer, 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 and yammer, 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 yammer. And I was going over here and going on over there. And my friend said, and this preacher said, and that person said, and the political people said, and this and that and the other and all this kind of stuff. And it's distractions to do what? To keep you from seeing and hearing what God's trying to do for you. And His mercy, His vision, excuse me, His vision has has not changed for when he said, go build a wall. Amen. Have fellowship with me. Stay in the boat with me. But the distraction that comes in is not just by people. It's by raising up that. And guess what happens? It wears you out. A doctor said one time that a really bad nightmare is the equivalent of you playing nine innings of baseball, what it does to you physiologically in your physical body. You wake up after a bad nightmare and you're exhausted and you've been sleeping. It doesn't seem to make sense, but see for your mind whether it's real or not. Here's what he explained to me. He said, listen, whether there is really a bear outside the door or not, if the person believes there is a bear outside the door, it will have the same impact as if there was a bear out there. 
So what happens? The battlefield comes for the mind. Why? Because if we can control how people think, get their focus off the author and finisher of our faith, put their, their, their response to this in their own hands, make sure that we keep their attention on something other than Jesus Christ and trusting Him, and then all of a sudden shift that responsibility where it ought to be and put it back on them, guess what happened? Man, I'm exhausted. I don't know why I'm just tired. I'm just wore out. And a lot of it has you think, well, I ain't been doing nothing. I went by a place the other day to get some stuff for the house and doing, doing a few things around there myself, believe it or not. And so far, I still got my fingers. But at any rate, I'm there. And, and, and literally, I go by these particular shelves and they got the news on. And people are at work and they're listening to the news. And you can hear the intensity because you've got to understand it's entertainment. It's not news. It's entertainment. That's, that's what news is nowadays. That's why like when the hurricanes come in, like you just had your first tropical depression right off the coast of Florida. It was out there. It was a low and it developed into a depression. And it's one of the earliest ones of the season. But that didn't really grab any traction because nobody said hurricane, nobody said anything. And they found out in Florida it was going to hit somewhere in Carolina in the Her in, at Hatteras or whatever. So people are like, yeah, snooze fest. I ain't why. So guess what? It goes off the news cycle and they got to put something new in the news cycle. You say, why? Because they know you turned it off. Like, I don't care about some tropical depression out there. I could care less. Alberto or whoever it is. I could care less. Earliest one of the season. Big deal. Don't care. I want to hear, but I'm watching, I'm listening to this, and here's the news medias. They're constantly, they're in that sports voice. Even the women, their vocal cords are squeezed off, and they're talking the way up here, like, oh, this is the most terrible thing in the world. The kid didn't get the snow cone. It was terrible. It was the end of the world. And they're like, what happened? This kid didn't get the snow cone. Oh, the government's moving in and taking away our right to sell and peddle food on the side of the street. They forgot to tell you that the snow cone was laced with just a little bit of poison, but I mean, you know, that's a minor detail. But, but you listen to the tone more than you listen to what's being said, right? And so what you have now is professional orators that are really good at controlling your fluctuating emotions by how they operate with their voice. And so guess what? The bearer of the burdens is decayed. I'm going to say some of us are wore out. And part of it is because we're tuned into the wrong station. I, I'm not saying don't be aware and don't be prepared. Sure. But can I say this with all due respect? Some of you are not built to cipher large amounts of information and to be able to pick things that you need to let go and other things that you need to go, okay, that could be. And if it is, some of you need to realize that even if it were true, there isn't anything you're going to do about it. It's not going to change anything, and it's not going to change what you do the next day. Very few of you, using my traffic illustration, would change the way you go to work if that place was on your way. Because you know what you would think? Well, they say that, I don't know, State and Maine is a bad intersection. But if that's on your way to work, you know what you'll think? Well, it may be bad for other people. I've been driving by state and Maine every day for years now. And it may affect other people. It ain't going to affect me. I'm, I got it. Right? Yep. So that's sometimes what happens is that you have to recognize that anxiety. It makes you tired. You ever go to a ball game you're not even playing? But your kid is? <laughs> and you get home, it's like, baby, I got to sit down. What's wrong with you? I'm wore out. Well, you didn't play the game. Yeah. Well, you didn't play the game on the field. You sure did give that referee an earful. Yeah. <laughs> Number three. Are you staying with me? Are you with me so far? We're coming to Hebrews. I'm watching my time. If I run out, I, I promise you I'll quit because i got several meetings. But I, I want you to understand. Look at number three. This, first of all, that the people are there for the distraction. Then notice the decay that's there in verse number 10 that has to do with the anxiety. And then he says there's too much rubbish. Come to Hebrews chapter number 12. Too much rubbish. Now I want to deal with discouragement. This is really the meat of my message. 
The old preacher used to say the number one killer of Christians is discouragement, routine duty. He had that picture that if we look at and you go in there and he asked me about the picture, I've told you the illustration before, and he said that's the number one killer of Christians. What is that? It's routine duty. It's discouragement. The strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed and, and there's just too much rubbish. You know what can happen sometimes, ladies and gentlemen? Sometimes that fatigue can set in, but sometimes the frustration of looking at what we've done in the past can be so much to try to get out of the way that we can't get done what God wants us to do. You know, little things like I've been divorced. So for years, preachers made, said that that made you a second-class person and that you couldn't do anything but breathe air and come sit on the pew, but we got a special place roped off for you because we don't want that disease to sweep over and catch somebody else. And that's what self-righteous preachers preached for years. You could commit murder and be a deacon or a pastor. You could commit adultery and fornication and be a deacon or a pastor. You could commit any sin you can think of, but if you've been divorced... Too much rubbish. Too much rubbish. Some of you made decisions really early in life and guess what? It didn't pan out like you thought it should and, and then later, and you were saved. And the next thing you know, you recognize you made a mess and things didn't work out the way you were and then somebody has falsely impressioned or imprisoned you to make you think that because of what's laying there in your past, that prevents you from doing anything in the present. I don't know, I, I wrote down several of the things unless I go and make a mess of this thing. Uh, somebody has oftentimes been messing around with drugs or drinking. Children out of wedlock. That actually happens, believe it or not, in Bible-believing churches. I don't know if you know that or not. Some people have quit before. Some people have gotten depressed before. Now be careful, Pharisees. If I haven't named your sin... Be, be real careful because I don't care what it is if you're honest in light of the Bible all of us have too much rubbish Amen. well I waited too long I'll never he can't do nothing with me now well I'm no good well I'm worthless I'm lower than whale poop in the bottom of the ocean I'm just no good I'm just terrible I'm just okay good God takes broken things and fixes them doesn't drive a trash truck. He drives a recycle truck. He takes a Moses after a murder and turns him into the leader of the children of Israel and likes him so much that after he buries him, he digs him up and uses him in the tribulation. And God uses him to end the book of Malachi when he talks about Moses and Elijah. He takes an Elijah under the juniper tree, made a mess of things, and he said, hey, come on. I'll use you. He takes a Paul who was a Saul and turns him into our apostle and does things that are supernatural Amen. in nature with him. He takes a David who committed adultery and murder and makes him the greatest king in all the nation of Israel. See, what can happen is, is oftentimes when we look in the past, it becomes an excuse because we listen to what other people say. If other people say you're no longer qualified to do something, it may be that you want to go find another place to go where you can't do something. I'm letting you think about that for a second. Too much rubbish sometimes comes from you not forgiving others. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse ten. It's a wile or a trick of the devil, because you won't forgive those that have wronged you. Somebody did you wrong and you won't let it go. It's too much rubbish. You know what'll happen? Quit coming to church. Quit reading your Bible. Quit praying. Quit getting anything from God at all. Why? Some Christian did something stupid. And instead of you letting it go, like Jesus did for you, you hold it against them. You know what you just think? Well, too much rubbish. Yep. Then somebody asks you to do something or be involved in something. I don't want to be involved. 
Last time I was involved, they didn't eat my tater salad. Be jumped if I bring any more tater salad. Ain't granny third time twice removed made that tater. Best tater salad in the world won awards out there. If Paula Dean was around, she'd have voted it the most acceptable, most tasteful tater salad in the whole southeast. And they wouldn't even touch it. Of course, you know, old preacher's wife put hers out there first and that's why people was already full when they come to mind. my name on the bottom of the dish didn't even get the dish back. <laughs> Corningware. Antique. <laughs> you go on eBay or antiquities.com find out that Corningware dish is worth $5.99. You're laughing but you know I'm telling the truth. You can tell when you go to a to a, a a dinner when you have it up here. You can tell individuals are kind of like, "Have you tried? Have you have you tried that right there?" <laughs> chef back there in the back, you know, Chef Saputo is what I call him. I don't call him Marine. He's back there and he's switching the dishes around there, kind of like, "Ah, oh, I don't know about that, man," because he moved it out of the limelight. It's not directly on that spotlight. That little. Things not heating it just right, and, and so then you wait till he's not around in his little jacket, and you can, so we can get the limelight. Amen. And the next thing you know, you're holding a grudge against somebody for something as silly as walking by your dish at dinner. And in the light of things, honestly. Everything comes to about that level. Yep. Secondly, I know I'm getting close to 12. Just bear with me for a second. Secondly, sometimes you won't forgive yourself. Amen. Preacher, if you knew what I did, let me make sure I look at everybody. So I'm like, why you got to be looking at me? <laughs> Just checking. But oftentimes it's hard for us to believe that God's forgiven us for the sins of the past. And not all failures are sin. But God's forgiven us of our failures also. We didn't measure up. We didn't pass the test. We dropped the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The motive wasn't wrong. We weren't trying, but we, we messed up. Amen. And instead of getting back on the proverbial horse, that's how I was trained, you get your butt, pardon me, you get thrown off into the dirt, you get back on the horse, we're like, I ain't riding no more. That horse don't lie. All horses hate me. <laughs> Best rider ever been around. But they can't handle me. Just try to throw me off. I'm trying to help the horse. <laughs> Jeremiah got thrown in a pit by the very people he was trying to help. But he didn't complain against the people. He said to God, I ain't doing it no more. Because before long, you know what happens? We start blaming God for our own inability to forgive ourselves. And the devil takes us captive. I'm not going to have time to go to Hebrews 12, but would you just he said, let us run the race that's so easily set, uh, that is set before us. Let's run with patience the race so easily set before us. And then he said, uh, and lay aside every weight and sin with just so easily beset us. And run with patience the race that is set before us. Do you see that? That's in 12, 1 and 2 there. But patience can get us, can't it? Because we expect perfection. I like to see when people get up here, I like to see when they get up and they get ready to play a song or, or, or sing a song or to preach a sermon and they mess up. You say, you're kidding. No, I, I like that. It brings a human element yes, to, to the service. That's why our services don't feel like a production. It doesn't feel like we're trying to be professionals. It just feels like we're trying to minister. But part of that is, is that the temptation is, is that after you mess up because you're embarrassed, you're afraid to get up. 
Well, I can't do that. I messed up. Okay, try again. You're doing it for the Lord anyway. Try again. You messed up. You did some stupid things. Okay, good. Get up. Try again. People say, well, what about that person? I mean, they messed up. Okay, good. I, the only thing I can do is look at my own personal life and realize <laughs> the Lord's been mighty merciful with me Amen. personally. And he said, okay, you messed up. You're right, you did. He doesn't let me off the mat and go, oh, you're right, you did. Don't worry about it. I made you that way. It's really my fault. No, he's like, no, you messed up. You're whacked out. You know, I shouldn't have made you that way. I made you that way, but I told you how to fix it too. But you didn't put any effort in that. So, yeah, it's on you. I'll let you accept responsibility for it. But now get up. Because the mission is still the same. I'm going to have to finish this next week, but I, but I want you to understand something. It's real important if you only get the distractions and if you only get the decay of the bearers of the burdens and you don't only clearly understand that when there's too much rubbish, we often refuse to build. Now, I'm not a builder. Brother Holland is. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. I did not meet with him prior to this, so he would have a answer to the question. If you've been given the responsibility of building a building and the foundation is covered with rubbish, is it safe to build the building on top of the rubbish? Even if you can cover it up, putting it inside the walls, just build your walls a little wider, cover that up, it's safe to go ahead and build. So what's the first thing that has to be done? Now, I'm not a builder, but I wouldn't want to buy a house that had been built on a garbage dump. Here comes a positive part of the message. You ready? God knows we all have garbage in our lives. Some of us have bigger trash heaps than others. <laughs> Just saying, not y'all, but the people watching on the internet. You know them internet people? <laughs> them internet people, that, they, because they're not here with us, you know, it's us and them. <laughs> them people got lots of rubbish. They got garbage piles. For us, we just need a little hefty bag, a little sweep and a little whisk broom and a little dustpan and we're good, right? The watching on the internet went from, you know, however many it was, all of them, they all just turned it on. <laughs> Tell me I got trash in my life. <laughs> God knows we all have garbage in our life. Disobedience, you, you name it, okay? Now watch. He said, I want a wall built. But before you can lay the cornerstones and get things done, we got some garbage, some rubbish that needs to be gotten out of the way. From your past, even from your present. Now, I want you to build the wall, but I don't want you to build something that's going to come down. So here's what I'm going to do. I've provided for you a way to clean the foundation off so that everybody who's willing to clean the foundation can build something. Because yep. a little bit later on it says, and we returned every man to his work. Everybody's not doing the same thing. You understand? Everybody has different levels of garbage. But it doesn't matter how much garbage, it doesn't matter if it is a piece of paper, as I understand it, if a piece of paper is there and you're trying to cement two things together, if that piece of paper is there, it is going to create a breach because it will not allow the cells in those two concrete structures to stick together. That's why when you get ready to put certain things on, you got to sand it down first because the paint won't grab because you're painting over paint and the next thing you know it's peeling off and, and that kind of a deal. Am I right, Brother Brian? You're a builder and does that... Kind of close to right. Okay. So, so here's what I want you to understand. What the devil wants to tell you is there's too much rubbish. rubbish. There's no way you can clear all of that off and build anything. Do you understand that the tribe of Judah is looking at the job and you know what they said? 
instead of seeing the fact that God's with them and God's behind them and God's blessing what they're doing and the king's with them and those kind of things, you know all they say is? There ain't no way with all that rubbish we can ever build anything because here's the mistake that gets made. We won't pause long enough to clean the foundation. 1 Corinthians 3, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is Jesus Christ. We won't pause long enough to clean off the foundation even though He has provided a way for us through the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. to say, you need to clean off all the rubbish. Some of that rubbish was left by other people. Sometimes you get stains on you from other people. Yep. And it hurts. And the Lord said, that's rubbish. I, as long as you're hung up there, I can't build anything. You can't do what I want you to do. You've got to get that out of the way. So he provided for you the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what he said? If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Amen. Clean the garbage out of the way. Yes. Forget the things that were in the past there that you did that were wrong. Stop letting them be used against you. Forget the people that are hindering and hampering you and put it under the blood and let it go. You say, why? Because the devil uses the rubbish, and I'm done, to prevent the building. Isn't it interesting now? Now think for a minute. Your creator, the God of the universe, that made you, knew when he made you, human nature was you're going to have garbage in your life. Rubbish. And so he said, you know what I'm going to do? Instead of making them perfect after salvation, I'm going to provide a cleansing agent so they can keep the foundation clean so they can continue to build, so that whenever things build up, they can clean them up. Last illustration. I've been watching. Brother Roger, Brother Lance have got me cameras where I can watch what's going on out here. I'm not spying. I'm interested in what's happening, and it's very interesting work, what they're doing, tying steel and putting stuff. Sometimes I come in and just watch from the second floor what they're doing, what Brother Matt and them are doing. And an interesting thing to me, one day they pull up out there, and there's this huge dumpster. It's a construction site. There's nothing but dirt and grass out there. What's left after, after Mr. Donut Man went out there and spun donuts in there and slung mud all over the house, all over the church and all that. But at any rate, before we started doing what we're doing now, it's nothing but dirt out there. And they're in there and they're just tying steel, digging holes, pouring concrete. That's simplifying what's a very complex thing that they're doing there. It's got to be measured. It's got to be shot with a transit. It's, it's just a, a laser. It's a, it's a big deal. But here's what I'm saying. It doesn't really appear that there should be that much trash. Right. You know, they bring the lumber out that they need to build the forms, and they build the forms. And I haven't looked at it this morning, but I looked at it last week. The dumpster is full to overflowing. And I'm thinking... Where'd all that trash come from? That's good. But it's interesting, the contractor knows the benefit of keeping the contracting site clean. Right. Hmm. Very good. Yep. You say, why? Because if the foundation's not clean, when the building starts going up, the building is only as good as the foundation. Yeah. That's good. But he knows I have to keep the rubbish off the foundation. That's good. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you consider this this morning? Would you consider that maybe you've gotten too easily distracted by all the hype of everything that's going on? I'm not even saying it's not justifiable. I'm just saying, would you consider that maybe it's possible that you've been distracted maybe even by some of the brethren, well-meaning as they may be, getting you excited about things you shouldn't really even be worried about? And is it possible that maybe you're wore out because your focus is more on something you can't control instead of something you can? And last but not least, is it possible 
that because of the rubbish that's there, the decay is beginning to set in and that maybe you need to sweep the foundation this morning. Well, there's a way and I'm going to pray. And the way to sweep the foundation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You confess your sin, not your brothers or sisters. To Him and admit that to Him. You know what the Bible says? He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. He gave you a cleansing agent. He knew when He made you and saved you, you're still going to need to get the rubbish out of your life. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might help us to not just forgive others, but to forgive ourselves as you have forgiven us. Lord, that you might take this message and use it somehow or another to help strengthen and encourage the people going through an unprecedented time. And while at a time like this, it is so easy to be overly connected to things in this physical life beyond the point of just being safe, that the anxiety and the worry and the care and the concern overwhelms us to the point that we're exhausted physically, mentally, and emotionally with all of the unknown questions. And Lord, last but not least, that maybe we've allowed the garbage to begin to pile up on the foundation. Might you help us this morning to consider these things in light of the judgment seat of Christ because that's going to be here long after the virus is gone. And might you help us to pay attention, Lord, to what it is you're trying to do in our lives personally so that we might do something, build something that would be pleasing to you. Help our lives to be a manifestation, a ministry and a message to people that watch us during such a difficult time. And Lord, I'd like to thank you for these people, for surrounding me with people that have been so calm and cool and collected during a very difficult time. Thank you for allowing them to come in and gather today. Give us guidance and direction, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.